Well, good evening. Welcome to the service. I hope you're having a very good week. I know I am with raspberries. It's that time of the year. 178 is our first song together. 178. Jesus, fellowship divine. 
271 is our next song together, and if you're able, we invite you to stand while we sing number 271. Forest Allen, if he'll lead us, please. Dear Lord, thank you for the day you've given to us and the blessings you've bestowed upon us, Lord. Be with us that we may look to thee for every trial or need in our lives. And be with the sick ones that you may lay your healing hand upon them. And 
be with us that we may look to thee on our decisions and whatever we may do be with the other new testament churches that's bringing forth thy message and be with our world that they may know that thou art the way and the only way lord be with the pastor and the teachers and forgive us our countless sins we ask these things in christ's name amen please be seated well it's good to see each of you tonight we'll be taking our text out of the book of revelation and we'll be in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. We certainly have a lot to pray for and pray about and pray that uh, wouldn't happen and other things that it would happen. We need to also pray to stay ahead of the devil's work in our life. I think the Bible has given us enough forewarning about his capability about his strategy and how he has everybody in his sights. And uh, so sometimes when you get alone with your thoughts with the scripture on what the devil's doing, well, you wonder what's next. And then you wonder, is it already in motion? So we really need to be, like Christ said, watching and praying. Well, <clears throat> we might also uh, just uh, present to you for prayer is there anything that you can do for God's house? And just give you a thought to uh, put out there. And if you, after a special blessing, well, that might be something to entertain. We also want to keep in prayer Sandy Adams and Jane Waite and Charles Maston and Linda Easter. And then we're glad to see Billy back tonight. Uh, she found out that you... You just don't bounce as good when you're older as you did when you were younger. So uh, anyway, we're glad that she's back and able to be with us. We want to pray for other churches, and we certainly want to keep our church's services and ministry and prayer here. Well, we have a prophecy in the 13th chapter of Revelation. It could be just a few years that these things will actually come to pass on our earth but there are things that we see more and more lining up and we see more and more possibility for these things to happen. I don't really know of anything that this chapter talks about that presently, as things are, could not take place. Um, earlier in my life, yes, there were some things that were very questionable yet as to how can this be? But now, uh, like we are, why, and with the many things that man has invented, I think that uh, without question, uh, these things could happen at any time, and it wouldn't have to have any major transformation as far as the world is concerned for it to happen. So we're kind of seeing the mystery of iniquity coming to pass in this chapter, which is spoken of in the scripture. We know what the devil's purpose is. The devil wants to take over the world. He wants to have a one world government that he's in charge of. He also wants to have charge of all religion that people might have to where that uh, it would, he would be the object of it, to where that it would be his authority and his plan that would dictate it. And one of the ways that God says he will accomplish this is in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4, when it says that he blinds the minds. He blinds the minds. Now, this is not that he just blanks people's mind out to where they don't see anything or know anything, but it means that his, um, his way of thinking is dominating the minds of people to where they don't see anything else but his way and the thoughts and the ideas and the plans that he has. So when you think about what we have in this chapter tonight, none of this would come to pass if man had not refused to glorify God as God, and if man had not refused to um, turn his heart and mind away from the truth of God, as Romans chapter 1 tells us, and of course, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that because man received not the love of the truth, that he will be sent strong delusion that he would believe a lie. So today, God's word, the Bible, 
and Christianity is being portrayed as really a hindrance and maybe even an enemy to social advancement. Now, they don't necessarily come out and say that, but that's the idea behind it. And I think you can see at, at where it climaxes to, to where that there'll be all that war against anything that is according to the word of God. So the, the beast now is brought before us in uh, the first 10 verses of this uh, chapter. I might say if you have um, a finger that you can stick back in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to be going back there and coming back to Revelation, going back to Daniel chapter 7, two or three different times, because they speak of the same thing. Uh, but they also give us a little more insight one unto the other. So here in verse 1 of Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, the sea is often referenced in Revelation 17, 15 as peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So back in Daniel chapter 7, we see this reference being made. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So the mass of humanity. These four beasts, as they are described in this chapter, we'll be reading more about it. They are the Babylonian, the Medes and the Persians, the Grecian, and the Roman Empire. Those are the four beasts that are referenced here. Uh, those are the ones that, of course, are... The, the big players in the devil's plan to dominate the world. So back in our text again, Revelation 13, you see the um, base, the power base, or the union that the Antichrist has. And uh, this beast, it says, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Very definitely, not anything that is of God. So um, you notice in chapter 12 and there in verse 3, which we had last week, it refers to a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So now we have the same identity uh, with the beast. And then in the 17th chapter... In Revelation chapter 17, and there in the ninth verse, it says, Here is a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. I just uh, <clears throat> thought of something because uh, when it talks about the seven heads, I think basically this is the Roman Empire. And then the great whore is definitely um, there with the um, Roman Empire at this time. And I had uh, someone that uh, argued this from a, ge uh, from a geography standpoint, and they said, well, it's always assumed that Rome is a city, the Vatican. But they said, and I've never been there. I asked him, I said, have you been there? And they said, no. And they said, it in itself does not sit on seven mountains, but Rome does. And so the uh, mystery Babylon is supported or sitting on the beast, the Rome. And so I think that's where you get the connection of the seven heads in verse nine being seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, 
which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast, and they have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Down in verse 18, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So the devil uses the revived Roman Empire. And going back to Daniel chapter 7 again. Daniel chapter 7. And this is uh, speaking of that fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire. Thus he said in Daniel 7, 23, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So the Roman Empire... Then you will have 10 kingdoms that rise up out of this Roman Empire. And then out of those 10 kingdoms is where the beast gets his uh, power base to rule during that period of time. So you might say a revival of the Roman Empire, but in a different form. Uh, having 10 nations um, rather than just being the one central government that it had in its origin. Now, the characteristics and strengths of this empire, um, back to Revelation chapter 13 again. Revelation chapter 13, and there in verse 2, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and a dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So going back to Daniel 7 again, Daniel 7, verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So that's talking about the Babylonian Empire and Nebuchadnezzar and the period of time that he went through in which he was driven and lived with the beast, and then he... Uh, was given back his, uh, his mental state and his power. And then the next one, in verse 5, Behold another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said it thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So the Medes and the Persians. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, he didn't live long, and four generals took over his uh, domain, and the Grecian Empire was then divided under four different generals. But tying this together, back to Revelation 13, the devil takes all that he has succeeded in the past in having power, and it combines it now. Uh, you have the, um, the, the leopard, you have the bear, you have the mouth of the lion, and then you have the kingdom of which there are 10 kingdoms that the beast is actually coming forth from. So all of the experience, the knowledge, and the successes that Satan has had in past world empires he pours it all into this one. And uh, he thinks that this is going to be his grand finale, which it is his finale, but it doesn't turn out so grand. Now, in the latter part of verse 2 of Revelation 13, it says that the dragon, which is the devil, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So <clears throat> Satan, the prince of the power of the air, as... Uh, the scripture tells us and how that he is ruling through worldly principalities and powers. All of this now is bestowed into the realm of the Antichrist 
And he's able to do this because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9 says that the restraints have been lifted. The restraints have been lifted now to where he can go ahead and bring all this together. Verse 3 says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. So here is a political leader that looked like at one time he was done, he was through, and he would never be back again, but here he is. He comes back. He makes a comeback. And so this could even be somebody that's alive today. We don't know. I mean, we really don't have any calendar to assure us of that. So you have this revived empire with a combination of all of the devil successes past being put into it, and it's existing with the power base of 10 nations out of the Roman Empire, which would be Europe, primarily Europe. And he has, it now has a comeback leader, a political leader that looked like he was out of the picture, you know, gone, never to come back, but he makes a comeback. So in verse four, we see this. They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. You say, boy, that's a big change in, uh, in religion, is it? You know, when you study the scriptures, you will find that the Bible says that much religion already is of the devil. And the devil himself has transformed himself into an angel of light. And Christ said there would be many that would come in his name saying he would, was Christ, but they would be deceivers. And 1 John 4, 1 says we've got to try the spirits because there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. So when you think about religion now, being on the devil's side, that's not something new. That's not something that the world has never had happen before. So in uh, verse 5 and 6, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. And so that's uh, uh, God's authority, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. So everything that is true of God, why it's going to be blasphemed and contradicted at this point in time. You say, well, um, how, how is that? Well, when you get into the scriptures, you will find that it was religion that opposed the Lord Jesus Christ. They were the ones that brought him to Pilate to be crucified. It was not some off brand. It was the religion that claimed to be the right religion. So what I'm saying is that these things are not that far-fetched to where that they cannot come to pass quickly. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 in the first three verses, when it talks about false religion, and it talks about how that they speak evil of the way of truth. And so you know that one of the biggest things that is blasted today by false religion is salvation. Once saved, always saved. Saved by grace. So it's not something that you really have to stretch to get to the point that it's, it's speaking about here because the opposition to the truth has always been on earth and it has really manifested itself in the days of Christ and again will manifest itself. So in verse 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So during the tribulation period, the people that are saved are going to pay a high price. There will be a great multitude that we saw in chapter 7 that were saved and martyred. But they would rather be saved and die than they would live and serve the devil. And so I think you can see that uh, the matter of serving God according to God's will is not a problem for people who are saved. It's only a problem for people that profess to be saved, but who are not. So um, this power, and Christ even spoke in John 16, 2, that 
The day would come that he that killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. So that's just carried right on in to the rule of the Antichrist. For this to occur, definitely, Matthew 16, 18, which says the gates of the hell shall not prevail against the church. Church is not here. The church has already been raptured. The churches have been raptured. So these are just people being saved. They are not working in and through a local New Testament church at this time. How can the world agree to this? Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that when men don't receive the love of the truth, during the tribulation period, they'll uh, be given a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So he deceives the whole world. It says, power was given to him over all kingdoms and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. That's an important statement. There are those that believe in dispensationalism. They say, well, you know, people in the Old Testament were saved a different way than we are today. Then there are those that say the people saved during the tribulation period will be saved by works. And on and on and on. God has only had one plan of salvation. And it was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That need arose with Adam. And that need can only be met in Christ. And I want to read two scriptures on that. In Romans 5, and there in verse 18 and 19. Romans chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners... So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So Adam and Christ. Christ was slain by God's pre-purposed plan, foreordained plan, before the foundation of the world. And the need for that arose in Adam, and the same need can only be met by Christ. So it don't matter what age you live in, if you are a human being, the only way you can be saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament time, people knew that. God had revealed that unto the people in the Old Testament time. So in verse 9 of Revelation 13, if any man have an ear, let him hear. So today's the day of salvation. And we need to take these things for reality, not just as if it's some you know, story out there that uh, maybe is going to happen one of these days. But God says, listen, take this to heart. So if a person is here tonight and you're not saved, you need to know this is the day of salvation. And it's not something to just push down the road and like they say, kick the can down the road. And then in verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And then notice this, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So vengeance belongs to God. He will repay. And we're to turn all of our grievances over to the Lord, relying upon his retribution to the extent, like Christ said in Matthew 5, we can even pray for people that despitefully use us. Because we know what's going to happen. We know God's going to take care of that. And uh, we know it's not going to be to where that they get off on anything. And so, um, like you find Christ even praying as he hung on the cross, Father, forgive him. They don't know what they're doing. And Stephen being stoned, he said, Father, forgive him. So we can turn it all over to the Lord and even pray that somehow these people would wake up before it's too late. And then in verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, so that speaks of power, and he spake as a dragon. So he's getting his, uh, his message from the devil. So here is a false prophet now. 
And uh, Revelation 19.20 talks about the beast and the false prophet. So it is a spiritual element, a false spiritual element. It's a religious element that is combined with the political. And we know that in our world, religion drives so many people. And many of the wars that are being fought are because people are being driven by religion. Not a religion of righteousness and of truth, but of hatred. So uh, here we have a religious element that's combined with the political element of the old Roman Empire. And uh, that pretty well sums it up. When you got politics and religion, then you're just about going to have everything else. So verse 11, uh, which we read in verse 12, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he claims to be the authority of God as we notice that uh, this was accredited unto the first beast that... Uh, you know, who's like him? And uh, there's nobody else that's like him on earth. And so he is uh, standing up against the traditional God in verse 6. And now this one comes along and he reinforces everything that the Antichrist is doing and gives it a religious flavor for the world. Now... <clears throat> We should not be surprised by this either. We are living in a world that most religions, it has a man as its head. You take the Roman Catholic Church, it has a pope. Uh, when you get into the Islamic religion, it's Muhammad. When you get into some of the others, um, they all have a man somewhere that they look back to and look unto him as a head of their religion. So this is a principle that's already established. It's already in the mind of people to look to a man as being the one who would be their uh, person to dictate to them spiritual matters. And this is uh, going to establish them a full allegiance unto the rule of Antichrist, both religion as well as politics. And 2 Thessalonians 2.4 tells us that the beast will even go into the temple of God and there declare himself to be God. Now in verses 13 through 15, you see how much that he enslaves people and how much people really fall in with him. He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed now, I want to go back to Matthew uh, chapter 24, and uh, Christ uh, alluded to this in his teachings about how this would be. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, and I think I can find the verses. Um, verse 23, Matthew 24, 23. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So this is not going to be some off the, call, you know, just something that's just minor. This is going to be major. And man is superstitious. And so all of man's uh, curiosity about this is going to be answered 
with the signs and the wonders that uh, this uh, religious, false religious leader is going to be able to come up with. Uh, Christ even said that you won't believe unless you see signs and wonders. He made that reference also. So religion all over the world claims to do miracles and have signs that validate them and people are taken in by these claims of signs and wonders. Um, I know years ago, I don't know how long it's been because time really goes by, but there was supposed to be an apparition of the Virgin Mary in a junkyard. And boy, that really went viral all over the world. You know, there's, a, there, oh, there's a, something that indicates the Virgin Mary. It was some sort of a shadow cast in a junkyard. I would think that I would want to have a little better setting than that. If I was going to be God and make some message to man, I think I'd choose somewhere besides a junkyard to do it. But anyway, the world went crazy over that. And uh, you might still be able to uh, research that under the apparitions of Mary. There have been many. And of course, for anybody to be declared to be a saint by the Roman Catholic Church, they have to have done, I don't know what it is, three miracles? One or three. And uh, so whenever you have the Catholic Church canonizing somebody, and under their way of doing things and making somebody a saint, they are attaching with that, this person has done miracles. So uh, that's something that man is very much into and really pays a lot of attention uh, to is these signs and these wonders that are being done. Now you notice um, uh, this matter that it says that uh, he had in verse 15, power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Somebody says, well, how can that be? Well, technology can track people. Tr technology can know what you're doing, what you have done, or what you haven't done. And so we have that technology. It's with us in our day and time. And this is not something, like I said in the beginning, these things are not yet to be answered as to how they can happen. Uh, they can happen, even with what we know now, and there may be more yet to come. You know, we might think that we've reached the end of the age of technology. We have it all. We may just have the beginning of it. There might be a whole lot more, yet it can unfold to make this that much easier. In the 16th verse, he calls with all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So they have to join up. They have to be identified with this uh, political power. And they have to have the identity of this, uh, uh, this world government because if they don't, they're canceled. As you see in verse 17 that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now that can be done. That's something we now have technology for that. That if you don't show your credentials, I'm sorry, we can't serve you. And you say, well, there'd sure be somebody with sympathy. No, people would be motivated by fear. They would know, I can't serve you. Even though I want to, I can't serve you because if I do, it's me that they're going to get. So this thing will work. Um, the Antichrist is going to get this working to where that if you're not with the program, if you're not doing what the program requires, you'll be canceled. And you just won't be able to buy or sell. And of course, at that point, people will think, well, I'm just committing suicide if I don't get on board with this. You see how this is going to work? Uh, it'll be a mind thing that's going to work on people to think, well, I've got to do this. I've got to get the mark of the beast. And my kids have got to get the mark of the beast because if we don't, we're just killing ourselves. So, you know, forget about it and do it. So uh, man will look upon this as a moral obligation. 
I've got to do this. We've got to do it for our family. And he will consider it to be the means of salvation for himself and his family. And of course, it turns out to be a curse because Revelation 14, 9 and 10 talks about that those that worship the beast receive his mark. They're going to drink of the wrath of God. Now the identity of the beast, and I am not going to speculate on this. I'm just going to go with what God says and let it be revealed in time. Because it says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. So that establishes that this is a human being. And that his number is 600, three score and six. Now, I'm sure there have been all kinds of books written about this. There have been all kinds of identities made, but it's a man with the number 666. So just keep that in mind. Um, sometimes the number 666, when they are found together in a, in a uh, phone number or something, you know, or an account number in your credit card, boy, people go ballistic. But don't worry about that. That's not it. Uh, I know a man uh, years ago, he came to church for a little while, and then he, of course, didn't come because he didn't agree, but he was afraid to get a Social Security card because he thought it was the mark of the beast. And uh, even though his Social Security number wouldn't have that combination. But uh, these are not things to, uh, to live in fear of. They're just things to be made wise about. And... Um, Somebody says, well, you know, this Antichrist, uh, you go back to verse 3, he was wounded to death and uh, he came back to life again. I want to throw this one at you. And I heard this in a Baptist church and I heard a lot of amens about it. That the Antichrist is the same person as Judas Iscariot and Judas Iscariot is the same person as Cain. So you have Cain and Judas and the Antichrist, all the same person. Boy, you talk about something far-fetched. And how in the world people can get on uh, that kind of a bandwagon because there is no scripture to support such a wild theory. If this was that sort of a being, he would not be a man to start with. He'd be a demon. It would also mean that the devil has a power to resurrect people because I believe Cain's in hell. So if this is Cain, the devil would have the power to get Cain out of hell and give him a new body, reincarnate him, and then turn him loose. I mean, those things are so far out. And yet, a lot of people, wow, the same guy, you know, the same being, well, that's not the case at all. The devil does not have that power to deliver from death and hell. He does not have the power to reincarnate people out of hell and bring them back to earth again. So when you hear those things, just realize, hey, somebody's really trying to make an emphasis here for themselves. They're not really on track with what the Bible has to say to us. So um, all of this are things that man has already um, had in his experience. He's already agreed to the way that it operates. And the devil has employed these in the past and even in the present, but not to the extent that they will be during this period of time. I mean, they're going to be revived, they're going to be ramped up, they're going to be empowered, they're going to be given new polish, and uh, it's just going to be greater than it's ever been before. And God shortens all of this to where that he only has three and a half years. And then, of course, uh, he will come to a ruin. So not only does the Bible warn of the world following the mystery of iniquity, but it also speaks of professed Christians turning away from walking with God. And uh, of course, excuses uh, are always a part of that. But uh, God warns us about alienation 
and about getting away and about uh, uh, iniquity abounding to where that our love would grow cold. Christ asked the all important question in Luke 18, 8, when the son of man cometh, will he find faith? Will he find faith on the earth? First Thessalonians 5, 23, we'll leave this verse with you in closing. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I would say that the Holy Spirit still wants us to hear those words. May we bow our head for prayer. Our Father, as we come to you tonight, we know the world's headed for a very dismal time. And as the scripture says, it's a time that's never been before upon this earth. It'll be so severe. We who are in Christ, we have a glorious future ahead of us that we may have to pay the price that others have paid in times past because of our faith, but heaven will surely be worth it all. And there is going to be no comparison whatsoever for the glory of having served you uh, through, through all eternity with perhaps some expense, you might say, of what it's cost us now. We do pray that you'll undergird us in faith, and we pray that we'll be very much concerned about our status with you, about our faith, about our service, and about how things are going with us all in all spiritually. We ask that you would give the invitation. We want to give you the honor and the glory and pray for any that would need to accept Christ, that they would realize that now's the time because there's so much going on to completely divert the minds of people away from spiritual things to where that the time will come even before that they even aware that it's too late. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand while we